management, we talked about that this afternoon, remaining a top priority for them, um, often actually at, a, at the expense of a, a concern for enduring design quality. Um, I think um, architects do need to up their game in terms of their ability to engage with their clients on those issues. Uh, and they need to be able to demonstrate um, that design is not simply about aesthetics. Um, it is actually also about um, designing uh, a designer-led approach to managing risk, to defining risk and to managing risk. Um, and the same thing applies to assembling financial packages. As, and as I, I said, you probably have um, fantastically developed skills in accessing um, complex uh, government grants, loans, and subsidy systems. That is not the future. That is the past. The future is private finance. It's bankers, bankers talk, understanding how to fund projects uh, with you know, senior finance, subordinate finance, mezzanine finance, all these kinds of things, um, hedging. Um, actually, there is a tendency for everybody to feel that um, other people's disciplines are somehow much more complex, much more difficult um, to understand. It's not true. Actually, if you devoted your time and attention to it, you could understand uh, property development finance perfectly well and perfectly easily if you wanted to, and you could talk the same language as those other people, as is demonstrated by the fact that some architects have made that transition. Um, most recently, you must tell me when I'm run out of time, because I don't know what you're, but, but uh, if you're happy at the moment, I'll carry on. Um, uh, most recently, I've been uh, a member of a working party established by an organization called SCOSA. Um, now, SCOSA represents the heads of schools of architecture in the UK. And uh, several statistics have stuck in my mind. Um, the first is that now we have an uh, annual tuition fees in the UK, which are set at £9,000 per annum. I suppose that's about €10,000 per annum. Uh, this is, a, from my point of view, a highly regrettable situation, but it's a situation that we have. Um, and with architects studying for five years full-time, it has been estimated that only 2%, only 2% are likely to pay off those accumulated fees in their working life. <laughs> now, you can say that simply demonstrates that the fees are too high, or you can say it demonstrates that the sad fact of the matter is, is that salaries in the architect profession are far too low. And actually, to my mind, it uh, uh, demonstrates uh, to me, it suggests that actually this is an unsustainable profession, a profession that cannot uh, service the cost of its education is in trouble. Now, you're in good company because the same thing applies to engineers and landscape architects and so on and so forth. So, um, and it's probable and hopefully you'll never be, find yourself in the situation where um, you have to um, pay these kind of fees. Although I have to say I'm really nervous about that because there is a tendency for what starts on the other side of the Atlantic. It works its way into Europe via the UK. And, gradually gets out everywhere else. So um, you may find that you also end up paying fees. But um, just in case you were interested to know, um, in this business of, of salaries, um, in the league table of pay by job title in the UK, architects were ranked 44th, behind police officers on 34th, and train drivers at 24th. Um, it'd be interesting to know how that would work uh, in Croatia. Um, this is a curious situation because when I gave my, my presentation to the uh, uh, Architects Congress of Europe, there was the uh, European Commission uh, commissioner there um, who talked a great deal about how Europe needed um, to take advantage of the vision and expertise of the architectural profession. Um, and it's, and, it, and it's um, uh, difficult to see how they can have that expectation when we have a, a profession that is so poorly paid. Um, 
what I think I need to say is that in the UK, I'm going to go back slightly, um, five years full-time education in the company of other architects tends to breed a, a fairly introverted uh, mindset and emphasize what architects have in common rather than what they share with others. Um, Forty years ago, the majority of architects in the UK were directly employed um, by the public sector. Today, that proportion in the UK is minimal. Instead, most architects work in private practice. Um, and as we said, many of those are sole practi practitioners. Now, this is regarded as completely normal by all those architects, most of whom don't now remember that uh, previous generations worked for the public sector. Um, why is it that so many young architects coming out of architectural education dream of setting up their own practice rather than uh, j joining um, existing firms um, or have the ambition to create um, great uh, practices, great businesses themselves? Why don't we have um, um, more architects creating uh, companies like um, Arup or construction companies like Skanska? Uh, where are the European equivalents of um, Acom and Gensler? What's actually happening in the UK is that more and more architects are being employed by contractors. First of all, over 50% of architects' clients are contractors now, so that many um, end users prefer to contract with, with architects via a contractor, complete reversal of the historic relationships. And actually, increasingly, contractors are going to be employing architects directly within their own workforce uh, because they'll perceive that as being um, a more efficient way of doing it. And that's going to require a change of attitude uh, from uh, many architects who uh, have um, views about professional ethics, about um, uh, traditional relationships and separations, clients, contractors, architects, which actually, um, I suspect, no longer fit for purpose in the 21st century. We have to work our way th through finding a new position for architects, which maintains our self-respect, which I think hopefully would um, put more emphasis on the value we bring to society, while at the same time giving ourselves a more secure financial future. So, um, to conclude, um, my own sense is that architects have so much to offer, not just in their traditional territory, but much more widely. And uh, heaven knows, um, society faces enormous challenges that could benefit from our attention. Uh, so many architects in Europe are underemployed, and, and the problems are vast. And although the future may be quite challenging for architectural practice as we know it now, the fact of the matter is, with, with a, 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 a rapidly expanding global population, and massive urbanization of that global population, we need to create uh, a, a massive step change in the quantum of built environment and master planned environment. Um, and that's our job, that's what we do. Um, so if we can find a way of structuring our profession, um, we should have lots to do but we will need to learn new skills. We'll have to be open to doing different things as well as the traditional things. And we'll need to engage, this is the real point I would like to leave with you, we will need to engage much more proactively um, in the political debate and discussion. Um, in the, it may be different here, but in the UK, there are virtually um, very few uh, architect politicians, but uh, I'd like to say that last year uh, a past president of the RIBA, uh, George Ferguson, um, stood as an independent mayor uh, for the city of Bristol, which is um, a, a large and very successful provincial city in the west of the UK, and he won. Um, he, he took the popular vote, and I think that that's uh, a real sign of change and a sign of hope um, that um, architects can use a political route 
uh, in order to bring architectural skills and values to bear on citywide problems. And I think that's an example for all of us. Thank you very much. Uh, I don't know if there are maybe we do have time for one question maybe if there is a question or we do not have time. Yes, one fast please question. Well, um, actually, the uh, impact of uh, Eastern European accession states on the UK has been very significant, uh, but not in the field of architecture. Um, what we have noticed is um, very large numbers of people from um, countries like Poland and Czechoslovakia and the Baltic states moving to the UK in much greater numbers than we anticipated. Um, this is partly because um, London has... To, uh, really not been impacted by the global financial crisis. Uh, const it, it, it construction has continued on major projects, the Olympics, the Crossrail, big office blocks, and uh, for some architects, they've sailed through it without any problem at all. Others have found it difficult. But we haven't had lots of architects young moving uh, to the UK. Uh, as the economy picks up, um, I think that may change because um, as construction gets back to um, uh, the pre-recession, -re pre-crisis levels, um, what's happened in the meantime is a lot of UK firms have been out all over the world trying to find work. Um, as the, as the e global economy expands, those firms are going to find they, they do have... a a lot more work than they can do without recruiting. Um, and I, I would not be at all surprised if they don't then start recruiting uh, quite extensively um, from within Europe. Um, I know that uh, they really like um, architectural students from Spain and Germany because they have that engineering discipline built in there as well. Um, um, but I'm, I'm sure that if there are good students from Eastern Europe, um, they could well find over the next two or three years that um, London is an interesting place to look for work. Thank you, Mr. Robinson. So 